Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. It's 150 years since Darwin published The Origin of Species, and almost the same time since Mendel discovered the laws of genetics. So for 150 years, we believed that this piece of information, the DNA, encodes all the secrets of life. The Human Genome Sequencing Project believed that if we will sequence enough humans, we will find who is going to develop cancer and who is going to develop PTSD and who is going to be rich and who is going to be poor. However, the idea that DNA by itself is sufficient to explain the complexities of life has been challenged also a century ago. If you look at yourself, you have eyes and legs and, and livers and hearts, and they're all different, but they still have the same DNA. So how could one DNA have so many different forms? And actually, a UK scientist called Conrad Waddington coined in the 40s the term epigenetics for the first time. His idea was that something happens to DNA during gestation, that one cell, one DNA, the same DNA, can express itself in so many different ways. But he had no idea what happens to that DNA. When I started my graduate studies, our job was to clean up this DNA from anything else. Then we looked at the DNA, and there was the genetic code, that's part of the DNA that actually uh, provides the information on the proteins, and the rest we called junk. And the idea was, during evolution, bad things happen, and we just accumulate this junk, but it's the genetic code that carries all the secrets. This was genetic determinism. It's still around, in spite of the fact that in the 40s as well, it was discovered that DNA is not just the genetic code. And there's something really pleasing about genetics. The idea that you're born with good genes, you'll be good, whatever happens to you, you can throw that kid anywhere, he will be smart. And if you're born with bad genes, whatever you do is going to make no difference. However, we know that that interaction has a huge impact on the way the human develops. It changes the phenotype of that human. We also know that this interaction doesn't happen in an empty environment. It could happen in this beautiful Miami suburb or in the slum of Rio de Janeiro. And also that has an impact on how that child will develop. So, following on Conrad Waddington's footsteps, we discovered that those methyl marks on DNA actually punctuate the DNA. And if you think about GATC as the letters of the DNA language, these are the punctuation marks. They overwrite, they underwrite, they put exclamation marks so that the letters turn into a language. And the language is read in different ways in different tissues. So proteins called enzymes add those marks, remove marks, and this is sculpted during gestation. This is highly programmed, highly predictable, dictated by the laws of evolution. So if I now take a piece of DNA from a Neanderthal that died 20, 30,000 years ago, we can sequence the DNA and find his ancestry, the genetic information, who his father and mother were. But we can also sequence the marks, the methyl marks, and know what tissue it came from. Is this DNA marked only by the innate processes of gestation? It's, as you know, highly predictable. Your eyes will be an eye, your liver will be a liver, your heart will be a heart. Or external forces can also take the same DNA and mark it in different ways. And therefore, two of you can inherit the same DNA and develop completely differently. So this is the methyl group. It's added to base 
called cytosine, one of the four letters, in very particular positions in DNA. It's added by enzymes, so it's not an accident. It's an organized process. We are all methylated. It happened when we were developing as embryos. If this methyl group sits here, that gene doesn't work. And if it doesn't have it, it will work. And one of the reasons why this works like this, this is the same gene. But you see, these balloons are the methyl marks. When these balloons are present here, where the command for activating a gene is positioned, then the machinery that needs to express that gene cannot interact with it. And when these balloons are not present, the machinery can interact with it and activate it. So the same gene can be either active or inactive. And in every cell, it could be active or inactive. And one thing we forget is the biggest chemical industry in the world is our brain. Our brain produces chemicals all the time. As we sit here, you are producing chemicals, and these chemicals are acting on neurons and on your DNA in your brain. So why not social interactions also acting in the same way? So that changes the whole concept. The gene is not deterministic. It's in some sort of a steady state owned by you and by your environment to act upon it in different ways. Darwin developed the theory that he called natural selection. So what happens to genes? They change a little bit all the time. The sequence changes from one generation to the other. And then there's an environment challenge. For example, you know Eskimos who live in the north are short, and they have short fingers, so they don't lose heat. So natural selection was say there were millions of people. One guy had this mutation by chance. All the other froze to death. That one guy survived, and that his progeny will have this kind of gene. But what we're saying here, perhaps that process can go in a different way. The cold weather acted on their genomes in a way that now directed the change that, to respond to that. It can also act in a transgenerational timescale, where one generation can pass to the next generation information through the germline on the experiences of that generation. For example, examples that are now emerging are traumas of one generation could be passed through the germline to the next generation. Food information. Was it famine? And I need to save every bit of food and turn it into fat? Or was it plenty? And I need to burn all the food. We need different genomes for that. It is different corporation that has to deal with our genomes just don't change fast enough as far as natural selection goes to do that. And it's not a very effective process to kill everybody except the guy who has the right mutation. What is the information that the mother in a mammal passes to her offspring that shapes the life of that individual uh, throughout his life? There's life cycle stations. Puberty is an important one. What kind of sexual information do you get? Are you living in a co-ed environment, which means you have to be relaxed with your sexual behavior because there's going to be enough other sex around? Or you're living in an imbalanced environment where sexual aggressiveness is really adaptive because that's the only way you'll pass your germline to the next generation. There could be also seasonal timescales. We have a study where we looked at squirrels that freeze, hibernate during the winter in Canada. They change their entire genome. A genome that you need to use in the winter is not in the summer. They cannot change the sequence, because for this you need natural selection. But they can change the way the genome is marked. So essentially, epigenetics provide our fixed genome dynamic potential, the dynamic possibility to react to the world. A child is born to this world to three kinds of environment. The bioenvironment, which is all the other species around it, the physical environment, and then, of course, there is the social environment. Are you going to be born in the slums, in a ghetto, where you have to fight for your life, where being hyper-anxious is really a life-saving property, or are you born into an upper-class, relaxed neighborhood where being aggressive is not considered social fitness? All of this is fed through early life on the genome, sculpting the genome, 
to fit with that information. This is information that couldn't come about by natural selection. It just changes too fast. And that acts on the phenotype to adapt the child to that world. And actually, the epigenetic processes are not bad. They're good. They were selected by evolution to protect us. So our idea is that human disease is caused by actually normal adaptive processes that become maladaptive. The beauty and the promise of epigenetics. On one hand, I told you, it passes from generation to generation. It starts early in life and it stays all life. It's stable, but you can change it. Because these marks are not part of the DNA. They are marks on the DNA. They are enzymes that put them on and enzymes that take them off. There's an equilibrium. So we went in with drugs that I use for cancer, drugs that we call epigenetic drugs, and we could convert this rat to look like this rat, or the opposite drug, take this rat, look like this rat. So we proved two concepts of epigenetics. One, there is a conduit by which the world, the social world, can send precise, accurate signals to the DNA and mark them on the DNA, but nevertheless, it is not final. It's not deterministic. There are ways to change it, chemically and possibly behaviorally. Another great colleague is called Steve Sumi, has been investigating this model for the last 40 years. What he does at birth, he separates rhesus monkeys and raises some monkeys with their mother and others in a nursery. They're both getting very high quality care. The only difference is they have a real mother, those have a surrogate mother, which is a combination of a human nurse and a cotton wool monkey. And when you look at these monkeys later in life, they have completely different phenotypes. The monkeys that were not reared with a mother will develop alcoholism. You know, when you give a happy hour to these monkeys, the monkeys that had a mother drink and, and that's it. The monkeys that didn't have a mother will binge to death. They're much more aggressive. They develop diabetes. They develop cardiovascular problems, exactly like what we see in human population. So we try to see if that is limited to the brain or has signatures in other places. Each line here is a different gene. When it's red, it's methylated. When it's green, it's not methylated. You can see that the monkeys that had a mother and the monkeys that didn't have a mother look different. Their genes, hundreds of genes, are marked different. And we can separate them by this method, which is called clustering, almost as well as I can separate a liver cancer from a normal liver. And the other thing is that it happens in a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex and in T cells in the immune system. That opens up the possibility that we can now study social epigenetics in humans. We cannot sacrifice these monkeys during the study. These monkeys died for other reasons, so we could look at their brain. But we can look at their blood. How early does it develop? These were adults, right? The humans and the monkeys were adults. After 14 days of separation from the mother, you can already see these group of genes become less methylated, this group of genes become more methylated. The same thing I showed you before. It's an executive decision. The corporation called the nucleus is changing strategy. Hundreds and hundreds of genes are changing to adapt to that information that comes from the fact that you don't have a mother or you're maternally deprived. How can you prove it in humans? The only way to prove something is to randomize it. Because as much as I will show DNA methylation differences, let's say we looked at the British Birth Court of 1958 and we looked at people with poverty and people with wealth and there were differences. But who says if they're not genetics? So perhaps those changes in methylation are all genetically predetermined. They're not caused by poverty. They are the reason why they are poor. The only way to study it is to look at natural disaster. So what we did is we took an opportunity with another colleague looking at the Quebec ice storm of 1998, the worst natural disaster that we had in Canada. And you know we are really a blessed country if this was our worst natural disaster. But it, wasn't, it was bad. Uh, we didn't have electricity for a long time. And uh, the temperature was minus 20 to minus 30 and um, people had to move to shelters, and it was stress. 
So Suzanne King followed mothers who were pregnant during that storm and followed their children for 15 years after that. And now she established an objective measure of stress. She called it the storm scale. For example, some people were with their mother-in-law. That could be stressful. <laughs> Others were in their country home. That's much less stressful. And we did the methylation mapping in DNA of T cells of these 15-year-old kids and see how beautifully it lines up with increased storm. These genes get less methylated as, as the stress increases, and these genes get more methylated as the stress increases. If you can look at specific genes, you can see a very nice, almost linear relationship with the amount of objective stress that she established as a social scientist and the changes in methylation that we established as molecular biologists. So the difference between epigenetics and genetics is that we can do something about it. If somebody tells you you have this high-risk gene uh, for Parkinson, what are you going really to do about that? But if you have an epigenetic change, we can intervene to change it. So we found that during addiction, there is a dramatic epigenetic change. This is a rat model of addiction. The way addiction works in rats, you give them cocaine, like a pusher shows you some cocaine, then you're deprived of the cocaine, then another pusher comes after some time, gives you cocaine, and they go just crazy. They will push the lever to get as much cocaine as possible, like humans. At the time the pusher comes, that's a cue. It reminds you of the cocaine you took many, many years ago. The brain is opening up. We administer the epigenetic drug at that point. And you can see with one kind of drug, we reduced the craving. Another kind of drug aggravated the craving. So epigenetic drugs do have the potential of altering the way our genome changes our behavior. So to summarize, the lifelong dynamic epigenome is, I believe, an adaptive response to the world. The critical time of early childhood is when a lot of these signals come in. They feed on the genome through signaling pathways that tweak the genome to create a phenotype that will fit with the world that that signaling tells you. But this never ends. Our phenotype is constantly in relationship with the world. The world keeps firing into that. And it fires it on it in different ways. So for example, if we take the rats that had a high mother or a low mother, and we treat them with a drug called valproic acid, which is a mood stabilizer, but also an epigenetic drug, the response is totally different. So not only your genes define how you will react to drugs, but what kind of mother you had will also define how you will react to drugs. So this is a continuous dialogue. Our genomes accumulate stories of experience from past generations and from our early life, but continuously talk to the world and are altered based on their history. So history builds more history. And these interactions occur both with the chemical world and the social world. They both feed into our genomes. I'm invited a lot to Health Canada to talk about epigenetics, and they think I'm going to talk about PCB, about lead in the world, wall, and I tell them, what about a bullying boss? That's probably much more toxic than PCB in the wall. And what about your regulations, that you stress the Canadian population with your regulations cause much more trouble than what you're protecting from with these regulations? What are we protecting from and what damage we are causing by that protection? And it has to do with a new renaissance way of educating our children and ourselves that the social world and the chemical world are not disconnected. That humans are not brains walking on air like psychiatrists think, or bodies without brains like doctors think, that they are connected.